This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Americans began to move in great numbers into areas around them. The white youths had met the perceived threat with curses and rocks. It was a sad history that carried back to the city's 1919 race riots, which saw many hundreds of people killed in the area in clashes sparked by the drowning of a black teen whose raft had drifted too close to a Southside beach claimed by whites. To many, the neighborhoods were a fortress against a changing city, and they have long been key geography in Chicago's ongoing struggles with racism. To most Chicagoans, Bridgeport was an ancestral stronghold of sorts, and a political enclave that was synonymous with the Dailies. But mention many other family surnames in these neighborhoods, and their longtime residents could also tell you the street each of those families lived on, whom their kids hung out with in grade school, and probably which mass they attended. That was the real fabric. Politics, yes, but family first. Even in the new century, these neighborhoods are old Chicago. That old city fades but never completely weathers away. It's there in the bricks peeking from a newly opened pothole, there in a painted sign for a long-closed business that slowly disappears on a building, and there in the phantom rail tracks that appear on a side street, forever headed to nowhere. And, of course, it is there in the faces and voices of those who lived in Chicago long before meat packers gave way to tech lofts, the world's largest Starbucks moved to Michigan Avenue, and international tourists appeared in droves to take selfies in front of a polished metal bean. The Canaryville and Bridgeport of 1976 were not so glossy. They sat on the near southwest side, where Chicago's work got done. Canaryville was believed to be so named for the swarms of small birds that once flocked to the old Union stockyards, where untold millions of hogs and cattle were gathered in a sea of pens and butchered for shipment across America. The neighborhood was home to tidy blocks of bungalows and two flats owned by laborers, many of them Irish, and functioned more like its own town. Many residents knew as youngsters where they would go to church their whole lives and where they would be buried. The city's foundation grew here. They were proud of it. Bridgeport, too, gave its sweat to the yards. Its history is filled with tales of Chicago laborers, many of them immigrants, who toughed out challenging conditions in their new city to make a path for their families. Some historians note that one of the area's first place names was telling enough, Hard Scrabble, which could have described Bridgeport for decades. It grew up along the Illinois and Michigan Canal before becoming a political seat of power for the dailies. Those, of course, are some of the better things that can be said about it. It was also insular to a fault. It's a suspicious neighborhood, legendary Chicago columnist Mike Royko wrote of it in 1971 in his seminal book, Boss. A blend of Irish, Lithuanian, Italian, Polish, German, and all white. In the bars, heads turn when a stranger comes in. Blacks pass through in cars but are unwise to travel by on foot. Celebrations in 1976 marked the United States' bicentennial. The Sears Tower already spiked above the loop in the distance as a sign of things to come. But lifelong residents of Canaryville and Bridgeport, who were senior citizens that year, had lived as children in the Chicago of Al Capone. No. The secrets would not come easily. Jim Sherlock knew it, and that was fine. Lost causes are the only ones worth fighting for, Clarence Darrow supposedly once said. Maybe that's what this was. Whatever truth was buried here, whatever the streets of Bridgeport and Canaryville would dish out, he would take. He was as Chicago as they were. In some ways, the perfect person to take this up and not look back. The town where Sherlock found himself that day in 2019 was called Sandwich, and the name was fitting. He wanted the man in the house across the street from where the undercover car was parked to feel like he was in one. Sherlock had already spoken to the town's police chief to let him know what he would be doing there. He had told the chief the man was no real danger to anyone, and Sherlock needed no help or backup. The idea was to be seen and to shake up his target— make him think the investigation was much larger and more active than it was. 
The man inside the house might start to wonder why this unfamiliar SUV was sitting across from his home, and when the man took a moment to look...